I begin by saying everybody needs somebody to admire. You never get too old to need somebody to admire. I hope you're listening, Jim. <laughs> everybody needs somebody to look up to over the long term as a person whom we can respect, a person who sets a path that we can follow, a kind of an anchor point in our lives, you know what I mean? For me, Jim Wallace has been that kind of person since my seminary days in the early 1980s. That's 35 years. At the beginning, I was a fanboy. You know, just, he was Jim Wallace and I was a person in seminary. And over the years, I've had the privilege to eventually become his friend. In the session description, we hear some about his roles. Many of you already know that he is the founder and, and the president of Sojourners, which is uh, uh, described here as a nonprofit faith-based organization, network, and movement whose mission statement calls for putting faith into action for social justice. Sojourners is a remarkably sturdy, faithful expression of a justice-oriented Christian vision that has been doing the same thing in, a, in, in remarkably changing context for well over four decades now. So Jim Wallace is the founder and president of Sojourners. He's the editor-in-chief of their really quite spectacular magazine and online presence. He is a very gifted book writer. Uh, I began, uh, I think it was Call to Conversion for me. And, and then from there forward, a book will come out from Jim's pen that will surface and, and, and will make a, a big impact and then there'll be another one. The most recent one is America's Original Sin, Racism, White Privilege, and The Bridge to a New America, which everyone should read for sure. Jim Wallace is an activist who is often present in those places in which a Christian witness, a moral witness, is needed and has often paid the price for that activism. He is a a very compelling media personality, you might say doing public theology and public ethics on television and in print and around the world. So all of that is there. But here's the one last thing I would like to say before I uh, let him speak with you. Jim Wallace was there before the Christian right was there. Jim Wallace was there before Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson became household names. And no matter what they were doing, Jim Wallace kept doing what he was doing. And his integrity and steadiness and creativity has inspired millions of people, including myself. To have somebody that you don't have to be disappointed in is a, is a gift. And so, for this person who has borne a faithful counter witness to what often passes for Christian witness in this country, I am grateful. I wanted, in my presidential year, to have the American Academy of Religion community have an opportunity to engage with Jim Wallace. And so would you join me in welcoming Jim Wallace? Thank you, David, for those very kind words. It's, clearly, we have a mutual admiration society here, David and I do for many years. Uh, I feel very blessed and humbled to be here at this place, given what you all do. Learn and teach 
the meaning of religion, of faith, to students in this country and around the world. That's what you do. So I really feel blessed to be here. I can't think of anything that is more important at this time than what you do. Or as my scriptures say, at a time such as this. The title I was given was A Theology of Public Discipleship. The topic is daunting, especially in these days, but I've been trying to figure it out for a long time, and I'm glad to be here with you to help figure it out. So during the time that Sojourners was just starting, I would go to visit one of my elders, Dorothy Day, founder of the Catholic worker who may be about to be sainted, we are told. She was kind of going out as we were just coming in to this conversation about the relationship between faith and public life. And I remember visiting Mary House where she lived on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and there was this building right near the Catholic Worker House that had this wonderful graffiti. It's gone now, but here's what it said. It's an alleged conversation between a reporter and Mahatma Gandhi. It says, reporter, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think about Western civilization? Gandhi, I think it would be a good idea So I could see reporters today asking questions of young people like this. Reporter, what do you think of Christians following Jesus? Millennial, I think it would be a good idea. Now, conversion is the big question in my evangelical tradition where I come from and David does too. My first conversion was when a Sunday night revival preacher pointed his finger, it felt like, right at me and said, if Jesus came back tonight, your mommy and daddy would be taken to heaven and you would be left all by yourself. It got my attention. I realized it's six, I'd have a five-year-old sister to support. <laughs> so I asked my mom how to fix this, because she was good at fixing stuff. She told me to ignore all that scary stuff, but that God loved me, and she said, I want you to be his child. Sounded good, so I signed up. But my second conversion, evangelicals have many, <laughs> was more important. Now I'm 15 or 16, so I'm starting to listen to my city, my hometown of Detroit, reading the papers, hearing the news, having conversations with people. And something seemed very big and very wrong, but nobody would talk about it. In my white church, my white school, my white world. I was asking why we as white Christians, white Americans, seem to be living in a very different way from black Americans and black Christians just a few miles or blocks away. And all of my questions got answers like this. You're too young to ask those questions. When you get older, you'll understand, or we don't know why it's that way, but it's always been that way. The only honest answer I got was this. If you keep asking those questions, son, you're going to get into trouble. And that proved to be true. So I always tell young people today to trust your questions and follow them to wherever they take you. Trust your questions and follow them to wherever they take you. And that, believe, I believe, is central to our role as teachers, 
vocation scholars, that we have to listen carefully to our students' questions, provoke the deepest questions, and then help them to follow the questions to the answers that could be for them life-changing. That's part of, I believe, our vocation. And so not getting any answers in my white church and world, I went into what was called then the inner city of Detroit. I searched and found black churches and black Christians who I had heard about, but I had never met any. I took jobs in the city alongside young black men and older black men. I was saving for college and they were working very low income jobs to support their families. As I got to know them, I realized that while we had all been born in the same city of Detroit, we had grown up in literally different countries. And every day going back and forth to black Detroit from white Detroit began to change my, as we say, worldview and my ideas about faith. After one of those trips, an elder in my home, white Plymouth Brethren Church, took me aside and said, son, you have to understand Christianity has nothing to do with racism. That's political. That's political, and our faith is personal. That's what he said. That was the moment in my head and heart that I left. And they were sad, they were happy, I should say, <laughs> to see me leave. It was ironic that it was for me being converted out of the church that began the process, a pathway of leading me back to faith and the vocation for the rest of my life. So, I didn't have words for the elder back then, but I do now. God is personal, but never private. God is personal, but never private. So how do we interpret our personal faith in public life? That's what I've been trying to figure out and put into action all these years. That elder gave me the sense of my vocation without realizing it. What brought me back is too long a story to tell today, but it did involve going back to the New Testament. After years of organizing in the movements of my generation against racism, poverty, and war, in those movements I felt like I found my vocation, but I didn't have adequate foundations for that vocation. So I went back to the New Testament. When I got to Matthew 5 and 6, I read this Sermon on the Mount that I had never ever heard a sermon on in my home church. And I saw it was meant to turn the world literally upside down. But it was Matthew 25 it was that really drew me in and changed my life. I call it the it was me passage. It was me, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was sick, I was a stranger, I was in prison, and you weren't there for me. Lord, when do we see you hungry and sick and naked, stranger, sick and in prison? Had we known it was you, we would have at least formed a social action committee, something. And he said, whatever you didn't do to them or did to them, you did to me. The ones he called the least of these. He said, as I read it, I'll know how much you love me but how you treat them. I had never seen anything that radical in the authors I was reading at the time, Che Guevara, Ho Chi Minh, and Karl Marx. And I've learned ever since the best way for Christians to respond to a crisis always is to go back to Jesus, which we almost never do. So earlier this year, a diverse group of Christian elders, we called them elders because we were old, uh, Bishop Michael Curry and Barbara William Skinner, lots of us, decided on an on a Ash Wednesday retreat, a long liturgical process, to release a 
declaration called Reclaiming Jesus, a confession of faith in a time of crisis. We put the declaration out, and one of my amazing 25-year-old filmmakers and sojourners made a video out of it, and it's now been seen by five million people, particularly a new generation of believers and those who've left the church but wanted to talk about Jesus again. So I'm going to just use a little bit of that language to frame our talk today. It said, we are living through perilous and polarizing times as a nation with a dangerous crisis of moral and political leadership at the highest levels of our government and in our churches. We believe the soul of the nation and the integrity of faith are both at stake. It's time to be followers of Jesus before anything else. Interesting, these were all, you'd call them Christian leaders by intent, but they decided they didn't want to be called that in this declaration, Christians, but rather followers of Jesus. It goes on to say, when politics undermines our theology, we must examine that politics. Quoted the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state. The church is meant to be the conscience of the state. The question we face is this, who is Jesus Christ for us today? And as most of you know, that's the question Dietrich Bonhoeffer said was always the most important question for Christians to ask. So we can do all our historical work and analogies, but it goes back to that question that Bonhoeffer said we should always ask. Who is those who say they're Christians? Jesus Christ for us today. I was literally on a tarmac waiting to come and hear David's speech when they told us there was a ground stop because of weather in Denver. So I didn't hear all that you said last night, which I was really hoping to. But maybe this is a bit of a one-two punch in some ways because um, there is some critical information from a PRRI 2018 American value survey, which says white evangelicals, just out, are the only religious group with more than half, 54% believing that the U.S. becoming a majority of minorities in racial diversity by 2014 is a negative thing. The only population in the country. Two-thirds of all Americans say this is a good thing. White evangelicals are the only religious group with a majority, 51%, favoring a law preventing refugees from entering the country. Only 37% of the country supports that. The result in the way the country now views white evangelicals and white Christians in general has been therefore devastating to the integrity of faith in this country and it's caused great confusion around the world. So as Wes Granberg Michelson's new excellent book, Future Faith, lays out how the global church, how the church is now rooted in the global south, and how Christianity worldwide and in the U.S. is less white and less western than it has ever been. And how those trends are now just, not just continuing, but galloping forward. In the face of that change, the fearful reaction of white evangelicals to a more diverse nation is both tragic and lamentable because the most, let's remember, the most diverse human community on the planet is the body of Christ. The most diverse human community is the body of Christ. Now this is a broader evangelical broader than just evangelical, white Catholics, white mainline 
It's not quite as bad, but almost the same. And just to say, we get, did a gathering for a bunch of younger evangelicals, or as they would say, evangelicals adjacent. <laughs> you know why they said that. Recently, a majority of evangelicals of color, young, and a majority of women. And the text they went to right off the bat was Luke 4, when Jesus announced the meaning of the word evangelical. When he did his calling, his first gig, his Nazareth manifesto, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news, and the word there, as you know, is evangel. That's the word, evangel, good news to the poor. That was the text they all gravitated to, and they agreed as a group of evangelicals that any gospel that isn't good news to the poor is simply not the gospel of Jesus Christ. When the operative word in the phrase white Christian is not Christian but white, we are in grave theological and spiritual danger. That is the primary issue we must deal with if we care about the integrity of faith in our time. I think it's not just the president and his evangelical chaplain's court who must deal with this, but I would say some of my friends on the left and in the Democratic Party who are increasingly secular, who often exclude or don't want to talk to faith voices. And I want to just say this about that. I have fought religious fundamentalism my entire life. But the secular fundamentalism that now controls much of the left and too much of the Democratic Party is also as irrational, divisive, and dangerous. That's what I've fought for all these years. That's a longer conversation that we should have. So very quickly, I'd like to say, let's respond to this moment, not just with our politics, which of course is important, as many of us did in the last couple of weeks, but also with questions that Jesus either asked or prompted. Questions that he asked or prompted that I think go to the heart of our crisis today and could in fact bring us back and deeper to something better. They're very simple. I'll just briefly comment on each one in our limited time together. In whose image are we made? Number one. What is truth? Number two. Who is my neighbor? Number three. Who is the greatest? Number four. And what is Jesus' final test of discipleship? They're claiming Jesus' confession, which you can find at reclaimingjesus.org, has six declarations. I'll just read a snippet from each of these. One, we believe each human being is made in God's image and likeness. Racial bigotry is a brutal denial of the image of God. Therefore, we reject the resurgence of white nationalism. In our nation, on many fronts, including the highest levels of political power, we reject white supremacy and commit ourselves to the dismantling of the systems and the structures that perpetuate white preference and advantage. Genesis 1, at the beginning, they say, 26, 27, then God said, Despite all the noise you hear on the news every day about race, then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion, we would say stewardship, over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the wild animals of the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, but then when some people decide historically to have dominion over the other people, 
not share it together over the creation to take care of, tend the garden when we have dominion over others. That is nothing less than a sin against the original purpose of God, overthrowing God's intention at the beginning. And it has to be named that way because Imago Dei, well, let's put it this way, when it, and it was Christians. I'm a Christian. It was white Christians, British and American, who knew we couldn't do to indigenous people and kidnapped Africans what we were doing for our greed. We couldn't do it to them if we accepted or knew. We couldn't do it to people made in the image of God. So we said, they're not. And we threw away Imago Dei. That's what we did. We threw away Imago Dei and took their land and labor and lives away from them. This isn't just old history. On the streets of Ferguson one night, a young activist wailed, wailed with me. I still feel like I'm treated as three-fifths of a person. It says, contemporary as our systems of mass incarceration, policing, economics, education, and all the rest. So this racial dehumanization of people of color was our original sin that Brian Stevens says so well. Slavery never ended, it just evolved. And while many of us have said that and been criticized for saying too much about race, all the data now suggests Voting data, election evidence confirms that white racial attitudes and fears were indeed central to the motivations of voters in the 2016 elections. So in the president's final argument during this midterm season of caravans, criminals, unqualified, unequipped, black gubernatorial candidates, and would you believe smallpox and leprosy? Who does the raising of the term leprosy appeal to? Well, those Christians who know the Bible. That strategy led to one of distrust, division, fear, and hatred. And I would say this, Donald Trump revealed to me over the election that if racism is America's original sin, Donald Trump has become the chief tempter of America's original sin. Sin can be repentant, but it can be tempted. And now we are seeing the sin deliberately, strategically tempted. One more thing I'll just say is Raphael, Raphael Warnock invited me to the prayer rally at Ebenezer the night before the election asked me to speak on systemic racism. And what I ended up, I'm not sure why, but what I ended up Googling that Sunday night was Beelzebub, evil, the evil one, the tempter, the devil. And I, heard, I saw three names, descriptions coming back. The accuser, the slanderer, and the father of lies. That's what I found. Now we have political strategies based on the descriptions of the one who is the tempter. And violence comes from the fruit, is the fruit of that poisonous political tree, separating kids from their parents. By the way, I love the stories of Texas evangelical Republican women driving into their mega churches and at the anger of their husbands and their megachurch pastors had the wrong bumper sticker on their own cars for a different candidate and justify themselves by saying, we believe that babies at the border are as important as babies in the womb. So Trump isn't the cause, but he's the tempter now. He's a consequence. He's a symptom of our racial illness and sin. President Lincoln once said this, leaders should appeal 
to our better angels. That's what he said in his first inaugural. Donald Trump is, de is deliberately appealing to our worst demons and the right below the surface. So what we're engaged in, and my friends on the left don't quite get this, we're engaged now in really a spiritual battle, a spiritual battle between angels and demons, and we have both, angels and demons. Or as I talked to uh, someone in a conference just in California, of course, last week, we're engaged now in spiritual warfare. He said, what an interesting idea to put those two words together, spiritual warfare. He had never heard them before. So voter suppression, which we've now seen, documented in Georgia, Florida, and many other places, the suppression of a single vote is not just a partisan tactic, it's the denial of the image of God. And we have to speak to it in that kind of way. So how do we as teachers of religion help our students to see what's at stake here? And let me say a final word about this issue of racism. America still has a choice to make, a choice that it is still not definitively made. Will America be a racist nation going forward? Will our country continue to have a white preference? Or will it ultimately see our diversity as the gift God intended and not the threat the tempters make us fear? Some people like to say what we're seeing is the last, last gasp or death knell of white supremacy. You've heard that? I hope that's true. But this could be just another double down against racial equity and justice as we have seen again and again and again. There is always a new Jim Crow doubling down over and over again. That's the choice we must make, whether white people of faith in America really are people of faith more than they are white people. What is truth? This was Pilate's question. Pilate and Jesus are having a debate, right? You remember the story? They're having a debate about his identity and, and the truth. And Pilate realizes he's losing the debate. So he famously asks, what is truth? Then washes his hands of the discussion and kills Jesus. We've heard that truth is being manipulated, managed, deliberately undermined. We've heard that, and we've heard about fake news and all the rest. But I want to suggest that the problem with this president is not the record number of times he has lied. It goes much deeper than that. He's trying to get us to Pilate's question. Where we won't even believe anymore, there is truth. Or we can't find it. Or there are alternative facts and fake news and all the rest. He wants to undermine the very notion of there being truth so we can throw up our hands and say, oh, how can we ever find? This is deeper than lying. This is undermining the whole nature of truth itself. And the elders said, we believe truth is morally central to our personal and public lives. Jesus promises you will know the truth. And what happens? The truth will set you free. Jesus is connecting truth and freedom and saying, if you don't know the truth, you will no longer be free. This is what autocrats mostly want. So how does that concern us as scholars and teachers of religion about how we lift up the truth, how we speak to the existence of truth, the importance of truth, how to understand the difference in mistakes and lies and and falsehood, how do we teach our students? I hear this question from students all the time. How do I know the truth? Then Jesus asks, I love this one, who is my neighbor? 
So a young inquisitor comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, simply, love God and your neighbor <laughs> in all of our faith traditions. I was at the World Parliament of Religions just last week. They told me they had 246 religions there, and they all would mostly agree with that, love God and your neighbor. Well, this inquisitor, a young lawyer, by the way, I know this was a Washington lawyer. He has that tone of voice that I know so well. Just who is my neighbor? Meant to diminish and limit the scope of who the neighbor is. So Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, which everybody knows whether they're religious or not. But the heart of Jesus' message here is not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to one who, who, who stopped, didn't go to a meeting, he, he helped the man who was in trouble, he used his time, changed his schedule, used his resources, risked himself. That's what I'm looking for here, service and, and helping people. That's not the message. That's all good. Jesus is for all those things. The message is your neighbor is the one who's different than you. So the good Samaritans weren't thought to be good in Jesus' day among the Judeans of his time. They were, they were mixed race. They were caught foreigners. They, they weren't liked. He chose someone from another tribe who was helping someone from a different tribe than his as an example of what it means to love your neighbor. Who your neighbor is is perhaps the most central Jesus question in our political conversation in America today. Who is our neighbor? Who is your neighbor? What does that mean? Gustavo Gutierrez puts it, puts it so well. He says, who is my neighbor? The neighbor was the Samaritan who approached the wounded man and made him his neighbor. The neighbor is not he who I find in my path, but rather he in whose path I place myself, he whom I approach and actively seek. You asked me a little to speak about my own history over all these years. Here's what I've learned. My life has, mo has more been changed than anything else. My life and my worldview and my faith more than anything else by being in places I was never supposed to be and meeting people I was never supposed to meet or know or certainly become friends with. I had to go outside the path of my childhood and my church and my history to find the people who would finally change my life and later I learned change the notion that Jesus meant who is my neighbor. Our Segregation, residentially, racially, culturally. Our racial geography is not accidental. It's done by policy. It shapes who the churches are, I see all the time. It's not accidental, it's done by policy. So if we aren't willing to violate those boundaries of our geography, we'll never understand what Jesus means by who is my neighbor. How do we as teachers help students not just have new ideas, but wander outside their pathways, their normal pathways, interact with people and ideas and experiences that are fundamentally different than their own geography outside the path? That's what will change us. The test of loving our neighbor, those outside our path, is not merely defined by who's, who's in your neighborhood or at the water cooler. It's how do we find and make neighbors of people who are deliberately, systemically, ideologically pushed outside of our path. So, that has implications for teaching and learning about faith. And, as the Declaration said, we believe Jesus, this is the elders, when he tells us to go into all nations, making disciples, our churches and our nations are part of an international community whose interests always surpass national boundaries. 
we should turn our love and serve our world and all its inhabitants because therefore we reject America first as a theological heresy for followers of Jesus. What is truth? Who is my neighbor? How about who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? Reminds me of a hat. This question was asked of Jesus mostly by his disciples on many occasions. And there were teachable moments where Jesus is trying to enlighten his followers, his students, about what leadership does and doesn't mean. Uh, including, I would say, discipleship includes leadership formation. Leadership formation. I'm having, and for a number of years now, I've had these unexpected, very unexpected conversations with business leaders who are trying to figure out their crisis in their world, trying to figure out what business means ethically, morally. And, and it strikes me that this question of leadership is central to all of that. All of your students want to be leaders of some kind. How do you teach them not just what they should think, but how to be leaders? Luke 22, Jesus says, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, the leader like the one who serves. He contrasts that to the kings of the Gentiles who lord it over them. Whose, le whose leadership does lording it over sound like that? for us today. Jesus' call, I would suggest, for servant leadership is not just some kind of um, uh, esoteric, extracurricular thing that we all say we admire. That notion of servant leadership changes everything, including for those who want to exercise their leadership for a good cause, which is what the disciples thought they were doing. And many of our politicians think that too. The teachings of Jesus on this topic are really at the root of the ethics of what we call public service and public interest, which is not supposed to be a personal reward, but rather time set aside for something you all know in your traditions called the common good. Now the contrast between Jesus' ethic of leadership and what we now see every day out of the White House is literally overwhelming. When power becomes the goal over service, self-interest over public interest, conflicts of interest over the common good, winning and losing over mutuality and compromise, and personal narcissism over shared benefit, we are indeed in deep trouble about the fabric and nature and ethos and practice of leadership in our society. Here's what the Declaration said. We believe the Christ way of leadership is servanthood, not domination. We support democracy, not because we believe in human perfection, but because we do not. We both, how, we know how C.S. Lewis and Reinhold Niebuhr spoke directly to that. We believe in democracy, not just because we are so good, but we are often so not. We reject, therefore, any moves toward autocratic political leadership and authoritarian rule. We believe author authoritarian political leadership is a theological danger threatening democracy and the common good, and it says, all these church elders, we will resist it. We will resist it. I've been asked every day since the election how I think things are going, how I think we're going to do, and I say this, things are going to get worse before they get better. And our response to what's happening now will determine how things finally will move. It depends on whether or not in response to a crisis, we are willing to go deeper. 
to go deeper. Three ways. Deeper into our faith, whatever we call faith. Deeper into our faith. What are the practices, disciplines? Quiet moments, silence. What are the ways that we can not just react to all the incoming fire, I know what that's like, and so do you, but how do we go deeper into our faith? Two, how do we go deeper into our relationship with each other, particularly across racial and religious lines? How do we do that? How do we, how do we transgress our geography? How do we find a whole deeper sense of who we're close to? And finally, how do we go deeper in the relationship with those who we talked about before and I'm going to close with here are called the least of these? Those who are left out and left behind who are talked about but often seldom not talked with how do we go deeper into our faith, into our, all of our relationships, and as Brian Stevens says, our proximity, our proximity to those who are marginalized and oppressed. So I think, therefore, the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel is Jesus' final discipleship test. As I said at the, the beginning of this talk, uh, this was my conversion text. I later learned it was Dorothy Day's conversion text too. This is what brought me back to Christ out of the movements of my time which, in which I was angry at religion for what I had seen and, and hostile really. I talked to a group yesterday of all the philanthropists and nonprofit organizations, independent sector about the faith factor. They're all exploring the faith factor now. I said, let's, if we had time to go around the room and each of us tell how we have been hurt, betrayed, violated, assaulted by religion in our lives, it would take the rest of the day. We all know that. Let's take a deep breath. We all know that. So let's accept that. That's a given. And how do we understand the meaning of faith now going forward in each of our lives? How do we listen to each other and do that? This is one of the critical ways. This is the challenge, particularly for people who are successful in one way or another. All people of faith or conscience to measure our lives and measure our political decisions by the well-being of those who are always most easily forgotten and invisible. The text in the gospel is both personal and collective. All the nations, it says, were gathered before him they and their own people would be separated out by how they treated the least of these. Now, the Hebrew prophets are utterly clear. The prophets say that a nation's righteousness is determined not by its gross national product, not by its military might, not by its popular culture being the enemy of the world, but the nation's righteousness is determined by how the poor and vulnerable are doing, how they're faring, how they're living day by day by day. The ones Jesus called the least of these are now literally being targeted. When you deploy the American military over the holidays against those coming to seek asylum who are so fearful and desperate they are walking thousands of miles and they're welcomed by the U.S. military. A number of us are working and talking and praying about how a number of us will go to those borders, perhaps during this holiday season, to welcome them 
in a different kind of way. Matt 25 reminds me of my old friend and mentor, Mary Glover. Rose Berger down here from Sojourners remembers Mary Glover. We moved at Sojourners in 1975 into one of the poorest and difficult, violent neighborhoods in the city of Washington, D.C. Um, and that's where we met Mary Glover. She's one of those people that holds neighborhoods together like the glue of a neighborhood. And she helped me understand the deepest meaning of this gospel text. She was not a theologian or a formal biblical commentator. She was a cook in a daycare center for kids, but she taught and showed me the meaning of this scripture many decades ago, not long after we moved into one of the poorest parts of DC. After a while in that neighborhood, the needs were so practical, the neighbors and we decided to create a, this is Saturday morning uh, grocery bag thing. 20 blocks in the White House, people needed to bag groceries to get through the week, volunteers and their neighbors. So we somehow got that together and every Saturday morning, hundreds of people are lined up 20 blocks from the White House to get a bag of groceries. Very simple, it wasn't much at all. But after we gathered the stuff every week, we prayed, and Mary Glover, powerful Pentecostal woman of faith, would always say the prayer. And she prayed like someone who knew to whom she was talking. It's clear that she and her Lord were in regular communication. I remember Mary Glover's prayer still very vividly. She prayed, Thank you, Lord, for waking me up this morning. That the walls of my room were not the walls of my grave. And my bed was not my cooling board. I see heads nodding. Some of you can recognize that prayer. Then she prayed this. Lord, we know that you'll be coming through this line today. So, Lord, help us to treat you well. Help us to treat you well. I've probably read every, every commentary I could find on Matthew 25, and that's the best one I've found so far. She was able to see Jesus and point to him and the hungry people coming to that food line. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. As you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. She got that. She knew that was true. So in this declaration by the elders, he concluded by saying this, we believe how we treat the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the stranger, the sick, and the prisoner is how we treat Christ himself. That is a theological statement, not simply a political one. Therefore, we reject the language and policies of political leaders that would debase and abandon the most vulnerable children of God. We strongly deplore the growing attacks on immigrants and refugees and won't accept the neglect of the well-being of low-income families and children. Mary Glover's past now. I often miss her, but I know she would have talked about this as her post-election reflection. And she would have loved to have seen the fact there's now as a Matthew 25 movement, Southern California where I just came from, the Mateo 25 movement is rising up to defend undocumented people, young people who suffer racialized policing, and Muslims who don't know where they belong anymore in this country. She, Mary Glover, is one of the founders of that movement, and she would understand that. So these questions of Jesus, I think, are foundational. Somebody turn off their phone. (laughs) These questions I would suggest to you of Jesus are a much deeper way to get at the crisis than just doing our politics. 
Now, because I believe, Barbara Williams Skinner, some of you know well, and I were in a big conference on interfaith stuff and sent off to a workshop and uh, told to come out with something that everybody would agree to. So we came out with uh, two things. One, that we're all made in the image of God. Everybody agreed. <laughs> all the interfaith, we all agree. Second point, therefore, let's start an interfaith voter protection campaign to protect those who are being targeted to prevent them from voting, which we saw in these midterm elections. So we've begun something called lawyers and collars. We put clergy in the polling spaces with the lawyers. Lawyers are thrilled about this. We did it in seven key states. We're just beginning, we do it all across the country. So the clergy can say, interfaith clergy can talk to, as we did, a secretary of state and say, we want to help you make sure everyone can vote fairly. And we're watching you. Here's my collar, here's my card. We're gonna become friends. Or we're gonna help you with policing. We want you to be able to police in a good way in the community, so we're gonna help you. But we're watching you. And the polling places. People stood in line for hours waiting to vote. So now you've got a clergy there saying, uh, can I be helpful, is there something wrong here? Or here's some water, or here's some sandwiches, or maybe uh, the choir's out there to, to sing, to help people wait to vote. It's about putting the image of God, we said, into action. All the things we say we believe have to be put into action. Or why would people believe that we believe them. When David asked me to, to speak here about my 50 years of this, that's the heart of it. Unless we show people and tell people and demonstrate what we say we believe, it won't mean anything to them. And all the young people leaving the churches, you know, the nuns, the figures who, the, none of the aboves, by the way, I love the nuns, I love the other nuns too, because when I would go out and speak at these evangelical colleges when I was a kid, all these two rows, were first two rows, were always Catholic sisters in their habits. I'd say, sisters, why are you here? They said, well, Jim, this is a very conservative place. I said, yeah, that's where I came. And we're local. Yeah, I figured, but why are you here? Because somebody had to have your back. So I had nuns for bodyguards for many, many years. But finally, the nuns, the other nuns, most believe in God. They don't want to affiliate with us because of what we're saying or not saying, or doing or not doing. You know what they're drawn to? Courage. They're drawn to courage. And they want their lives to make a difference. So why would they be interested in any kind of religion that doesn't make a difference? They're not. Or when we got together for a retreat, a number of very prophetic faith leaders in Ferguson, six months after Michael Brown was shot and killed, with the Black Lives Matter movement in the room and had a retreat together, the Black Lives Matter kids said to their older um, elders, many of whom are very prophetic, I said, we're not against religion, we're not against God, most of us come from that, but we want to work with you and you can get to people we can't get to, but, but there's one thing we want to ask. We want to ask, what risk are you willing to take? And one of the most prophetic African-American preachers in this country, who's a dear friend of mine, said this to the Black Lives Matter activists. I've been preaching prophetically for a long time, but from a place of comfort. I'll never forget what you challenged me to do tonight. What's the risk that we're going to take? So these five questions that Jesus asked are the ones he prompted, are the ones I think we all have to answer whether we're Christians or not. They're all the right questions. Whether we're in a classroom or a church, in a political office, or out in the streets. 
people can say that Jesus' questions have nothing to do with our public life. They want to say that? Fine, discussion is done. But most Christians and most people of faith won't say that. They know that isn't true. So then they can say that they disagree with my or your interpretation of what Jesus meant when he asked these questions. And then we have a conversation. Then we go, and we have that conversation. Far more people than just Christians want to take these questions we asked today seriously. The questions, in whose image are we made? Who is my neighbor? What is truth? Who is the greatest? And what about the least of these? These questions plead for our answers. They plead for our answers as teachers, as learners, as those who want to understand and understand and want others to understand the meaning of religion and faith in the world. Those questions can lead, can lead to the occasion of transformational change. The sojourner's vocational phrase, and I'll finish with, with this, is we want to articulate, uh, we want to articulate that biblical vision of social justice, and we want to put it into action. So I'm still trying to figure out what is the theology, public theology of discipleship for every time and for our time right now. God help us May that be so because what we face right now, and I'll say it again to close, what we face now is literally what's at stake now is the soul of a nation and our integrity of faith. Can I get an amen to that?